It's amazing to think that in the 1900s, a mere tenth of the world's population lived and worked in cities. Today, it's more than half. I'm one of those people who lives in an outer suburb. I leave each morning for work when it's still dark. It's the only way I can beat the horrendous morning rush hour. And I'm just an average commuter. Our biggest city, Sydney, is said to be one of the best cities to live in the world. Yet it has unbearable traffic in the morning. Its housing is unaffordable, its emissions high. To me, it feels like it's reached maximum capacity. Yet Australia's population is set to double in the next 50 years. Surprisingly, that puts many of our urban planners in an optimistic frame of mind. Not only I'm confident that we can actually double the population, it'll be good for the cities. But I wonder, where will all those people live? work? How will they commute? And what will the city of tomorrow look like? I think cities tomorrow will look pretty much the same as cities yesterday. However, life in cities tomorrow will be extremely different. The way we will actually exchange with information, we will meet, we will mate, we will work and so on, that will be very, very different. In this episode of Catalyst, I catch up with some forward thinkers with big, bold plans for our future cities. Sydney Tower boasts the highest lookout in the CBD. I've come here with urban researcher Dr Julian Bolliter for a bird's eye view of a city sprawling in all directions. It's amazing to think that more than 100,000 people cross that bridge every single day, and that's just one direction. Absolutely, and mostly in private cars. And this is something as our cities get more congested, will become less and less viable. Australia's population is projected to reach up to 70 million by the end of this century. The extra space we'll need to live like this is mind-boggling. It means that we need to build a new Sydney every 10 years for the next 90 years. That sounds impossible. It does, it's a formidable challenge. It's taken us 200 years to build Sydney as we know it. We now need to build one of these every 10 years. So what does that mean for a city like Sydney? Are we just going to see ever more increasing urban sprawl? No, we actually can't. Sydney's pushing into national parks to the north and the south and to the Blue Mountains to the west. So in Sydney, the only way is up. It's a thought that's depressing to many Australians. The prospect of overcrowding and a slowly deteriorating way of life. But do we need to feel so dark about it? The thing with growth is some people see it as being a negative thing, as an affront to a suburban way of life. Other people, particularly developers, see it as a great thing. I think with all of these things, it depends on how well we plan for it. If we plan for it creatively and with foresight, it could be a good thing. It could improve our capital cities. So how do we hang on to our standards of living but still fit more people in? What better place to answer that question than the city voted the most livable in the world for four years running? Would you believe it's Melbourne? Thirty years ago, this central business district was a residential black hole. It was a project called Postcode 3000, which turned the city into the buzzing, arty hub it is today. And I'm meeting the man behind Melbourne's transformation. Hello, nice to meet, to meet you. you. Director of City Design, Rob Adams. 1985 was the turning point. That is when the councillors <laughs> wanted a 24-hour city and one that looked and felt like Melbourne. And one of the secrets was to bring back a residential population. People said we couldn't get Australians living in the middle of the city. Well, what has happened is we now have 29,000 units in the city, and some of those are small. So we've got small buildings like this one over here, where the top three floors of that were converted, and we've got another building which is empty over here, which is an eight-storey commercial building that's been repurposed for residential. So it was about small when we started, keeping the grain of the city, reusing a lot of the buildings that were here. Why did they think it couldn't happen? 
I think people are locked into this idea that Melbourne is a suburban city, that you live in a house in the suburbs and you just come to the city to work. It was an eight to five city. Part of our strategy was to make it a 24 hour city. Despite the naysayers, the plan worked. The dead inner city blossomed with new life. Rob puts it down to attention to detail. Since 1985, we've consistently used this fantastic bluestone paving. The furniture is consistent and high quality. And then simple things like flowers and trees. Those things really change a city. As people move from cars to walking, we've taken 45 hectares of asphalt out of our municipality and converted to wider footpaths and parks. A sidewalk flower stall is rented out by the council at a very low rate. The trade-off? It has to stay open late at night. It brings a feeling of safety to the streets with a nicer vibe than a corner policeman. That's one of the beauties of this whole program. It's, it's taken the fabric of Melbourne and actually entrenched it. We've gone from two sidewalk cafes to 500 sidewalk cafes. The city is a completely different place now. This is just typical of Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just... It's lovely, isn't it? Really, I think what's special about this place is that it typifies what Melbourne's done. It's taken something that used to be a service lane yeah. and now it's turned it into something that's iconic, almost as iconic as the Melbourne tram. If you're measuring cities, you're going to measure them in people. The number of people within a city is, is really the key to it. Rob Adams' challenge today is even tougher to accommodate double Melbourne's population in the next few decades without losing livability. He believes it's entirely possible. The secret is you've got to build on the existing infrastructure. So if you've got tram lines, put your population around the tram lines. We've got a few people in here. Nothing's more iconic to Melbourne than trams, although these days they look rather different. It's quite a flash looking tram. It is flash. And, you know, they now have to carry far more people, so again, it's huge efficiency you're getting out of the same infrastructure. And if you take the tram and bus routes in Melbourne, you can get 2.4 million people living adjacent to those routes without interfering with heritage and all the other sensitivities. That's going to make the tram routes more efficient. It's also put population very close to the services they need. The plan is to accommodate this new population in medium density housing. We haven't really facilitated that. We thought about a high rise in the central city and suburbia. In between is this other product, which is five to six storeys, medium density along these transport routes. So in streets like this one? In streets like this, where you've got plenty of capacity to actually add medium density apartments. Our stop in Fitzroy offers a perfect example of a street that could be transformed in this way. So what we see here is very low-level development. Not very interesting, not really actually providing the density and amenity that could be used by the people who live immediately behind here in the suburbs. Under Rob Adams' plan for the future, Nicholson Street could look like this. The study that we've done has shown that you can get the next four million in Melbourne on only 7.5% of the land. What that means is you're leaving 92.5% untouched. Those suburbs can actually plant trees, capture their water, put photovoltaics on the roof. They can become our new green wedges. And we can transform these cities without fear. Sound like a great fantasy? Well, it's already being done to great success in Sweden. Dubbed the City of Tomorrow, a 175 hectare industrial sector of Malmö is being transformed into a thriving, sustainable harbour development. Housing around eight times the typical Australian urban density. Different architectural firms design the blocks so they all look unique. Malmö is linked by nearly 500 kilometres of bike paths. That's even more than Copenhagen. As a result, cycling has soared, with 30% of transport journeys now made this way. 
green roofs and other spaces are designed with native fauna and productivity in mind. The new development gets nearly all its energy from renewables like solar, wind and water. And the entire city aims to run on 100% renewables by 2030. In Malmö, no food scraps go to waste. They're collected to make biogas, which powers buses and cars. What we're seeing here is not about having massive rebuilding of cities, but transforming our existing cities, taking our assets and getting more out of them. That really is the secret for the future. Carlo Ratti is an architect who believes digital technology can take our future cities even further by making them smarter. Think about life without the internet, without mobile phones. All those technologies that change our lives are entering urban space. Technologies are becoming distributed, network. What some people call smart dust is that you can sense that it's collected for some other reason, imagine from the cell phone network, but you can then analyze it in order to better understand how to optimize the city. By tracking people, Carlo Ratti's team have investigated all sorts of ways to improve efficiencies. From redesigning a subway line in Singapore to pinpointing parking vacancies in a crowded city. What it is doing is actually allowing us to have more responsive, dynamic, almost living buildings. It's about living bits and bricks. Digital smarts can even be used for healthier outcomes. In Hong Kong, Carlo attached air sensing trackers to people to show how they move through polluted and clean zones. The smart city concept is currently being realised in Santander, Spain. Here, 12,000 sensors have already been installed on buildings, in roads, on buses and lampposts to feed into a network of information on road closures, parking, bus delays, even the pollen count. Bins let garbage collectors know when they need emptying. Even the street lighting automatically dims when no one's around. A lot of this kind of nervous system of our cities can help us to respond better to changes. It almost makes cities and architecture like living responsive systems. And from that point of view, it certainly promotes adaptation. One of the most exciting and truly revolutionary ways digital technology can help transform a city is through sharing. We started sharing our private lives through social media. Now it's happening with houses, cars, holidays, even our belongings. There's Open Shed for Tools, Go Get for Cars, and websites like Airbnb, which allow individuals to advertise spare rooms for short-term stays. Think about a city like Paris, I think is the number one city in terms of Airbnb. And you know, that's equivalent to building many, many, many new hotels. But you didn't have to build them, you could just use spare capacity. The new generation offices are much more like common share spaces. Think about like a cafe space where you can go there, you can have a coffee, but you can also be your office because you've got your laptop and it can be your meeting room. And also the waste in the old city was having empty office building when people were at home or vice versa. This type of flexibility in the space and timing of work also has the potential to lighten our transport loads. Tomorrow, with self-driving car, that will go even one step further. And this is not a far-fetched future. We have self-driving cars now. Imagine a driverless car that could pick you up and take you to work, along with a couple of other people on the same route. So what you're doing, you're totally blurring the distinction between private transportation and public transportation. And if you want to think about what the effects could be, they're massive. We did some studies and calculations, and basically if you were to take a city such as New York or Melbourne, well, you could run the city and take everybody to their destination exactly at the same time, just with 20% of the cars we have today. And it's really about less asphalt and more silicon.
Central Park is an award-winning new residential and commercial development in Sydney. Its sustainability consultant is Professor Stuart White. Driverless vehicles, network city, wired city, are all part of the future, but what we're in danger of forgetting is that our infrastructure and also our mindsets will need to change if we're actually to achieve sustainable cities. Stuart points out our reliance on the current centralised energy system is incredibly wasteful. It's a linear system, a very vulnerable system, a system which generates electricity in large coal-fired power stations, and then it comes on long transmission lines and distribution lines, which are very expensive, with a significant wastage on the way and very low efficiency of production. The power station itself, we're throwing away two-thirds of the energy content of the coal, which is, of course, very greenhouse intensive. All in all, as much as 80% of the energy produced by burning coal is lost. And it already comes under strain, providing power at peak demand. You can have a much cheaper system, a much more reliable system, and one which actually reduces the greenhouse emissions. Whether the energy is captured from the sunlight or produced another way, the key to a cleaner, more efficient system is to decentralise to produce power at the level of individual buildings or precincts. Central Park gets power through a trigen system. Here's where the gas supply comes in to supply the engine. It's effectively like a very large truck engine which generates electricity via this alternator. So that's using the gas to produce the first product, which is electricity. So that's just like normal electricity generation. How is it more efficient? Well, the, the second product of it, and this is how it becomes more efficient, is that the heat is also being captured. Although it still burns a fossil fuel, every bit of excess heat goes to heating water or cooling it through an absorption chiller, helping to regulate temperature in the building and provide hot water. And that's improving the efficiency significantly compared to a, a typical coal-fired power station. Best of all, Trigen helps cut electricity demand by around a third and peak demand by up to 60%. In principle, you can be achieving instantly over a 50% reduction in emissions. 80% of the city's emissions come from the production of electricity. So if these systems were hooked up to whole neighbourhoods, there could be instant big savings. But state and federal laws stand in the way. We could make our cities as sustainable as they need to be. What is missing is often the institutional arrangements, the political will. So everywhere we look in the work we do, we find that these are the barriers that need to be overcome. As I emerge from the basement and into the sunshine, a green building towers above me, like a seedling pushing away old hard ground and bursting into the future. This 32-storey building has been voted the world's best tall building and is also the world's tallest vertical garden. Hydroponic irrigation systems grow a soilless veil of vegetation totaling 70,000 plants of mostly native species. A big problem in our future is rising temperatures. Cities can be even hotter because they contain materials like asphalt and metals. But a covering of plants can not only help insulate a building, it can also cool the city. And the quiet achiever in a lot of this is actually first improving the efficiency of the buildings. The more you can reduce the heat load, the more you can improve the lighting. Improving the efficiency of all the fixtures, appliances, actually reduces the heat load, which means you can make the air conditioning task even more efficient. Giant mirrors track the sun and redirect it so more plants can grow and the environment stays nice and bright. Most ingeniously, the gardens are irrigated by Central Park's own water utility, which harvests rain, waste and stormwater. The system here is one of the largest of its kind for a precinct development. 
It's another example of localising infrastructure. The water passes through eight filtration processes and is then reused in apartment washing machines, toilets and cooling towers. The plant is capable of producing a million litres per day and the system is designed so that it's possible for it to supply neighbours as well. So it's ultimately possible for this to be a net water positive development. Many of the elements that are being demonstrated here have been demonstrated elsewhere. But what's different about it is that you're combining all of those in an integrated way. On a larger scale, our parks are beginning to turn to water catchments. Garden installations allow our footpaths to harvest and filter rain, all the while servicing their traditional role. That's going to be essential for our cities of the future. Otherwise, we'll increase the problems associated with cities rather than looking at the huge opportunities that cities provide by bringing people together. Dr Julian Bolliter agrees, but he believes it's not going to be enough. All of these things you're talking about are eminently sensible. However, our argument is by about mid-century, really we can't just continue to grow our capital cities. Otherwise, we'll end up with mega cities, which is a Sydney of 12 million, a Melbourne of 15 million. When that happens, our livability will begin to drop away. Congestion, pollution, affordability issues will mean that the quality of life those cities offers declines. We have no nationally coordinated plan for how we're going to grow. We are, as a nation, sleepwalking into this population growth. The highest level planning tends to be the capital cities, but we need to be thinking at a much larger scale if we're going to adequately deal with this kind of population growth. So we're missing a very large part of the picture. So what's your solution? So what we think is really important uh, as the capital cities grow beyond mid-century is that we begin to think not so much in terms of mega cities, but mega regions. Essentially, it means chains of smaller cities connected with very good public transport infrastructure. So we could conceive of a mega region running from Brisbane to Sydney through Canberra to Melbourne, which is bound together by a high-speed rail link, and those cities will have access to affordable land, and they'll also be able to be designed from the ground up around the principles of 21st century sustainability. High-speed rail can travel at about 350 kilometres an hour, so there's no city along this mega region that is further than two hours commute on a high-speed train from a capital city. Decentralising the population means that each new city could be a small city. It's our calculation that each of these new cities on the high-speed rail links would be around 800,000 people. So that's a significant expansion of the existing population. And that's a very livable city. It is a livable city. It offers the benefits of urbanity and city living, but not the disbenefits that you start to get when a city reaches mega city size, which is 10 million or more. The idea of a high speed rail in the east has been toyed with for years. But a report released earlier this year shows it could now be cheaper than initially thought. Run on 100% renewables, be built in 10 years and would reduce transport emissions dramatically. Julian believes linked mega regions like these are the only way we can hope to accommodate a potential population of 70 million without destroying our environment. I think the most important thing that could come out of this discussion is that we begin to talk about having a nationally coordinated plan for how we grow. I must say, I'm ending this journey more hopeful than when I began. It seems there are a lot of potential solutions to the problems ahead, but it needs a major shift. Old laws, old infrastructure and old mentalities have to give way. Despite all the challenges increasing populations bring, our city planners remain optimistic we can adapt well to our future. We didn't have cities once upon a time. You know, cities came to existence around 10,000 years ago. And since then, they've been this beautiful invention by humanity to bring us together. And I think the powerful thing about the city is really that it allows us to make sure that the total is more than the sum of the individual part. It's about us coming together to achieve more with less. And really, the secret of cities is people if you can make them places where people want to live and want to actually stay. 
then that's a success story.